How many musical instruments did you experiment with before you settled on the clarinet? Uh, I started on the violin when I was very, very young. Uh, my dad is an amateur violinist himself. Mm -hmm. So uh, so my parents got me this tiny, you know, uh, violin for me to, to play on. That didn't go very well. I was like miserable. I remember clearly how like I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And it was very challenging. I'm left-handed, so holding the bow with my right hand, and that's how you begin uh, learning, was very challenging. And... Uh, and my dad, uh, we had the, the, the Britannica, the encyclopedia at home. And they had the system where you can send them questions. This is pre-internet, so you can have a coupon you send okay. with questions. And my, I remember my dad uh, writing them. Uh, and he told them, you know, my son is six or seven, I was at the time. He had been trying to learn the violin for a couple of years now. It's not great, mm -hmm. what do you suggest? And they responded a month later by like, you know, a bunch of articles, like studying my case and what are the options. And one of the options they suggested was that I should consider switching to an even-handed instrument. And uh, one of the instruments that fit that criteria back home in Damascus at the time was either the piano or the clarinet. And for me, when I was a little kid, a musician like equaled a traveler. And I thought pianists traveled with their own pianos, so I thought, like, you know what, I'm gonna go with a with a lighter instrument. So <laughs> clarinet was chosen, and uh, so I played clarinet, you know, most of my life. At 18, uh, I convinced my parents to get me a saxophone because hmm. I thought the clarinet wasn't cool enough, yeah. you know, standard teenage yeah. uh, situation. And I joined the rock band playing like cover songs on a saxophone, and that blew my mind. The fact that you get, uh, you start to get phone numbers from people in the <laughs> audience, you know, like, which I never had playing the clarinet. Yeah. So I experimented with saxophone for a, for a while, but then I thought, you know what, it's maybe it shouldn't be about the instrument. Maybe there's something beyond the instrument that I can try to work on. So I went back to the clarinet. I never stopped playing clarinet, but then I decided that I don't want to play anything else. I just want to produce a saxophone sound on the clarinet. Um, so yeah, so clarinet has been the main instrument with little bit fooling around with violin early on and saxophone mm -hmm. in the, you know, when I was between 18 and 24 or something. Uh, now, you know, I play very, very primitive piano, which I use for composition mm -hmm. mainly. That's pretty much it, I think, yeah. What was home like for you growing up? Uh, Home was, I mean, this is like, you know, the, I'm going to tell you the two sides of home. Okay. Home, the family, and home, the country, right? Uh, growing up in the, the household where I grew up it was amazing. My parents both are culturally very, very curious. And we grew up surrounded by art. Like, there's art everywhere at home. And they took us to, uh, to see exhibitions, to see concerts. Like almost every week, we'll go at least twice to see mm -hmm. a concert, and um, and we had lots of records at home. Uh, in the country, I think my parents tried to fill the gap, to fill a gap in in our education, my sister and I, because music lessons were never taken seriously, or art lessons, you know, in school were not taken seriously. So my parents uh, had to to fill that uh, that mm -hmm. void somehow. But I was lucky uh, that when I started to play the clarinet, for example, uh, that Damascus had this uh, institute called the Arab Music Conservatory in Damascus, where I was lucky to study with a, with a wonderful teacher uh, from the Soviet Union, who used to be like principal clarinetist at the Bolshoi Theater, and he managed to be in Damascus of all places. So I was lucky in that sense. Um, but, I mean, home is home. I don't know how to describe how was home for me then. I had a very happy childhood, uh, very much in touch with nature, with the community and the communities at large that formed what home is. Because I think that's the essence of home, really. And, the essence uh, of home is community? Community and how you interact with it, you know, but also nature. Um, I mean, there are places, there's, I'll give you an, an, an example. 
there's a village outside of Damascus, about maybe 10 kilometers away, where uh, the family, the extended family and their friends, everybody will come uh, every Friday. For uh, The Syrian weekend back then was Fridays. And uh, we'll go and we'll mingle, we'll, we'll eat, we'll cook. But most importantly, we used to work, like, you know, in the ground. So, the, so I planted trees when I was very young. So I had a great connection with the land. And I think the moment when you plant a tree, I think that's where home is, you know? And also not only planting a tree, but also caring for a tree or caring for, the na for nature. Uh, I mean, it roots you, literally speaking, right? So, uh, so home for me was a combination of being in touch with nature, being in touch with the city of Damascus where I grew up, going to see things, uh, meeting people and the community by interacting with the community and uh, I always thought that home is a place that you're able to contribute to without having to justify it and me playing music for the community was for me part of being home and of course I took that concept and now everywhere I go everywhere I play uh, when I play it changes my connection with the place like now we're here in the Governor's Island, I play a few notes. And for me, like mentally or metaphorically speaking, is as if I planted something. We moved to a new place in Brooklyn in November uh, 2019. And this place had a little backyard, right? And then the pandemic hit in March 2020. Um, at least we noticed it, uh, March 2020. Mm -hmm. And this backyard became our world. And after living for 20 years in New York, I had my first encounter with the soil of the city. I never looked down. Mm -hmm. Like even when I go to Central Park, if, you, if that's nature in New York City, or Prospect Park, I never like dug in the, in the ground to see what's there. Uh, so Leal and I bought this uh, Japanese weeping cherry tree. And I will never forget the moment when I planted the tree, it took me back to the trees that, I had, that we had in Damascus. Mm. But also I feel suddenly like this city is mine too. Like there's a tree that I just planted and I, I, I noticed what's there. And also the, the pandemic time allowed me to look up also to watch birds. I never imagined in my, in my life that I'd be bird watching in New York City, right? So suddenly there is a connection with nature you know, the summary of nature for me, which is the backyard in Brooklyn. And, uh, and Leal and I had, had time for ourselves too. And then uh, Shams arrived, that's the name of our son, which means son in Arabic. Uh, and he's born, like, he's born in Brooklyn, he's a, like a Brooklynite, I guess. <laughs> so now it's like, oh wow, there's the tree, there's Shams, and there's us. And the question of home becomes even bigger, you know. And now Leal and I actually talk a lot about this, is what do we want, where do we want Shams to feel at home? And I think our answer has always been we want him to feel at home everywhere he goes. You know, and I think it has something to do with identity and how you identify yourself versus how other people identify you. And... Uh, and I mean, I always think of identities as, as something that accumulates over time. Uh, to, I mean, to give you an example, uh, you know, I'm the, you know, like a guy, I'm the Syrian clarinetist, let's say. And I think, and then I became American last year, so I'm the Syrian American clarinet player and, and composer, whatever you titles want to put. And I think the next step is that I become the musician. And it doesn't mean that you're getting rid of identities. Actually, the opposite is true. You're trying to accumulate more and more identities. And we would like Shams to be a citizen of the world, really. In the same way that Leah and I have been trying actively in our lives, by interacting with communities anywhere we could. By playing or by just listening, too. And um, so yeah, so like we have now roots in New York, we have roots in uh, Beirut, where my uh, wife's family is from. Uh, we have roots in Damascus, where my family is from. 
We have roots a lot in Europe. Lael grew up in France part of the time. I spend lots of time in, in Germany. But, I mean, put me anywhere, I feel at home kind of quickly. And I like that. Well, you have a language to share because obviously music is universal. That's a great bridge to wherever you go because, you know, by playing that. Absolutely. I mean, it allows you a faster lane for communication. Mm -hmm. But but home is, I don't think it's only about the places that I, that I play. Um... I mean, how similar places are is kind of kind of obvious, and sometimes we forget that. The moment you take time, similar to how you did at the beginning of this episode, you know, let's take one minute mm -hmm. to just listen and see, and feeling grateful to to being in good health. You know, already that's a like an incredibly grounding experience, and you claim space. Or not, you don't claim space, it's not exclusive. You become part of the space. And, uh, and when you think about home this way, I think it's an ever-expanding sense of identity and home. Sorry, this is a long sentence, but... Uh, no, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's a, because it's, an, it's, a, it's a topic that I love to think about. Yeah. And I think lots of the music I write somehow has something to do with that. Well, what do you, wanna, what do you want um, to, to play now? I'm going to play um. actually a little melody that was inspired by Jisreen. Jisreen is this little village outside of Damascus that I told you about, which is, was famous for its apricot trees. Of course, the village was uh, heavily bombarded and uh, was under siege for many years in the past 10 years. So it's a little homage to uh, to the apricot trees, and but most importantly to the land and the people. So the name of the piece is just me.
That's comforting. Thank you. It's comforting for me actually playing it too. There's something to be said at the end of the day for being able to work in a garden and see the results of, of what you've done. You know. Absolutely. You know, yesterday we had we had a, a landmark actually collectively as a family. Uh, we planted some spinach. This is back in April. And now, like they are ready to be consumed. And now Shams is like about almost five months. So uh, he's starting to eat like solids just here and there. And yesterday it was so meaningful for us actually to get some of these uh, spinach and actually feed it to him. So we know, ex you know, there's so many personal connections mm -hmm. in one activity. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, and it's tremendous. I wish actually everybody would get that chance to be able to uh, to grow your own little one tomato, you know, to see how much patience actually agriculture is about mm -hmm. planting something. Talking, we were talking about meditation earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of meditation where you plant something and you wait for it. You cannot. There's no fast forward button on nature. You have to wait until mm -hmm. it's it uh, it's ready, right? And it's a, also it's another sort of um, like caregiving, where you pace it, you know, along uh, a much longer period. And but the result is, is super rewarding. I mean, actually, the best reward the fact that he liked it. You know, I mean, we had he had a tiny spoon of this spinach, mm -hmm. and he loved it. And so it was, it was great. You know, we're so much more, we're so much better and stronger with people than we are by ourselves. Absolutely. You know, and, and uh, you know, the difficulties I feel like is where the, is where the, uh, the growth really happens. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people tend to abandon things when, you know, when difficulties come and right. really think it should be otherwise, there should be an absence of difficulties, mm -hmm. but, you know, like mountains aren't made, you know, Without rubbing up against each other, right, right, right. You know, yeah, right. Um, and great work of art, works of art, are not always harmonious. Absolutely. You know, so you know, we all have a preference for for what we think home should be. We want it to primarily be a calming place and a place of refuge, but you know, it's not just a physical atmosphere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's uh, like you were saying, it's being calm within yourself, you know, right. in that center. You know, you know, there's something that I've been thinking about a lot about home. Uh, you know, some people, uh, for them, home is the place where you grew up, the place where you have right. memories, right? And other people, other people suggest that home is the place that offers you the most, from a very practical and pragmatic perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My theory has always been that, well, no theory, it's not a theory, it's just like a thought, that home is the place that you would like to contribute to without having to justify it. It's the place you wish well for, and like we said, it's dynamic. It can, it can start with your family and ends up to include the whole universe. It's the place that you wish well for. But a recent addition to this thought I had it's yes, it is the place that you would like to contribute to, but also it's the place that allows you to contribute to it. Because many of us do feel at home in places that does not allow us to contribute, you know? And that takes ho away mm -hmm. from it a little bit. And I think comfort comes from giving, not only from uh, receiving whatever great things this place offers, where you want to, again, similar to uh, like planting something, you don't plant, you're not eating the strawberry when you plant a strawberry bush. It's not even your mind. You get pleasure out of doing mm -hmm. that. And for, for us, for musicians, uh, when you play, like you, I never think of, oh, I'm going to get applause at the end, or maybe not. But you know, <laughs> this is not in, the, in your mindset at all you're immediately you're enjoying that you're making sound that I'm turning the air turn into sound 
and the fact that maybe I'm moving somebody in the audience. What I know for a fact is I'm moving myself. I'm activating uh, parts of my brain that otherwise would be left unactivated. So, uh, and that's very comforting also. Well, what has your musical journey been like? Not, not just, not specific landmarks, yeah. but how has it, you know, integrated into your, the fiber of who you are, so... Yeah, it, certainly I didn't expect this piece of wood and metal to make me go and travel the world. This was not part of, uh, you know, part of my plan. Um, I mean, it, it's it's hard to separate it from my life because now that's what I what I do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of my most you know dear friendships happened because of this. Uh, and you know, I met you know I met Lael, I met my wife on tour. Uh, thanks to this, I guess I met her. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's hard for me to know. I told you earlier, it's uh, one of the things that I missed the most during the pandemic is uh, not concert themselves, but hanging out after the concert, where you talk about things, not necessarily about the concert, but you interact with people. Like this mini party that happens after you play. Because there's a burst of energy, if you think about it, every time there's a concert, both from the audience and from the uh, artists alike. And this energy has to be met with like, oh, let's talk about what just happened, you know? And I, and this was, I missed that a lot. And maybe I missed the hanging out more than the concert themselves. Um, but uh, it's hard, I mean, back to your original question, it's hard for me to separate how did this affect my life? Because that is my life, mm -hmm. or at least a big part of my life. But in the same way, I would think m music is not the most important thing I do in my life, I have to say. Like if I have, uh, maybe actually being in nature for me is more important. And, uh, and I mean, all, you're asking me questions that make me wonder where I'm in my thinking process because the last two years or year and a half has been about figuring out priorities. Is it music making for music making sake? Is it music making as, oh, I want to do concerts? Or is it actually just playing music for my, for my son who's four months old now? Or, you know, 25? Or, I mean, how do you uh, compare that with like planting or spinach? Which one is more important? I don't, I don't have an answer, and you know? I don't, think, I don't think there should be one. You know. they, they feed into each other yeah. Yeah? and they, there's so much overlapping yeah. but if I have to give up one of them if that it, I mean I would not want to give up on nature I think there's something in nature that is by far richer than me playing a concert mm -hmm. that's, that's I think the point I'm trying to get at there's things in life that are more important than just me playing the clarinet well, what would you do if you didn't play the clarinet? Because, you know, that, bring, cause that brings you your... That's your livelihood. I mean, any profession, if you, if you put the passion behind anything you do, it will become the most important thing to you. Uh, I mean, would I would like to work uh, on a farm? Now, in theory, yes. Maybe if I start doing it after two months, like, okay, get me back to the concert home. I don't know. But uh, I always try to put things into perspective that nothing, nothing we do, because people are important and the environment is important, but I'd like to think that nothing I do becomes too important. I like to think, to think that connection with, with other people, uh, other individuals and nature should be at the top of my priority list, not what I do. What I do is only a tool for me to communicate. Communication, I think, is the most right. important. And this awareness has come about as a result of the pandemic and the slowdown. I've been thinking about this for, for, for many years, but yeah. now it became yeah. super clear. Yeah. Um, that like, oh yeah, right. 
the communication is what I need. It's not only the action of me playing or me writing. I would like to communicate. Mm -hmm. And this is only a facilitator, you know? And I always think actually of art in general along these lines. You know, to make meaningful art, you have to have an idea you want to express. You want to have a tool, and this is a tool. Mm -hmm. And you need to have the skills to use the tool to have and to express an idea. But with, with no idea, if the, you don't want to communicate anything, then just simply don't play. All of your compositions pretty much center around the idea of home. Mm -hmm. Which, mm -hmm. All right. And do you know where this, this uh, came from? Uh, for example, during the after the Syrian uprising, 2011, many of my works were inspired by what's going on, trying to also to bring attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. But then also during that, you know, maybe six or seven years after that, I realized that I owe it to myself to enjoy the freedom that music gives me, which means I can do music just for music's sake. It doesn't have to be everything about about home. So breaking free from that uh, was also part of it. But looking back at most of what I do, there's always, I'm trying to document, I guess, my emotions at different times of my life or uh, documenting experiences. And this next piece I'm gonna play, I think is about that, is what happens when your concept of home changes. And to make a long story short, uh, I think it was 2006 or seven, I forgot which uh, was seven years after I moved to the U.S. I was invited to my first Thanksgiving dinner, which uh, this wonderful family uh, invited me to join them. And it was for me in the middle of nowhere, according to my map at the time, which was in, uh, outside Delaware, uh, outside the, uh, D.C., somewhere in Delaware. And, uh, and I go there, and I had a wonderful time. And I felt, for the first time after seven years of being in the States, I felt at home. I was like, oh, wait a second. Like, is it a good thing to feel at home? Or am I betraying my original home to feel at home elsewhere? And it, it was such a, such a personal moment. The next day, they all wanted to go for Black Friday. I had no <laughs> idea what Black Friday was. I, honestly, I thought it was a restaurant. So I told them, no guys, I'm, right. I'm still digesting yeah, whatever we have. Yeah, I'm full. <laughs> so you can go ahead. So they went, and I was in this hotel, in the middle of nowhere. I didn't have a car. Mm -hmm. And I was like processing this whole concept of home. And I missed sounds that I used to hear behind my parents' place back in Damascus. There was a marketplace mm -hmm. where, where people, you know, uh, like make songs for like for their tomatoes and cucumbers, blah, 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 so people can come and buy. And I was missing that sound. So I wrote this song, well, not a song, I wrote this piece uh, called November 22nd, which was the date where it was written. Kind of homage to this, uh, how home continues to change and how the concept continues to surprise you, you know, over your lifetime. So, uh, so yeah, so that's what I'm gonna play.
Mm-hmm.